Hey there folks, how's it going? Shepherd's pie. We're talking tender, flavorful lamb with a cloud of fluffy mash on top that will comfortably feed the whole family without breaking the bank and cost of living crisis be damned. Let's get into it. Now, as the name suggests, shepherd's pie is made of shepherds. It's made of lamb. Lamb, yes. Shepherd's pie is made of lamb. Not shepherds, that would be weird. <laughs> I've got some great minced lamb from my local butcher today and I've pulled it out of the fridge about 20 minutes before I'm ready to cook and just broken it up a little bit. That mince is traditional for this dish, but for my shepherd's pie, I like to elevate it a bit. And what better way to do that than by adding some wonderful sweet roasted lamb flavor. For that, I've got this beautiful half shoulder on the bone and I'm just gonna roast that with a little bit of red wine. This is completely optional. You can leave this out and probably should if you're just making dinner for a Wednesday night but it does add some great flavors and textures into that special occasion pie. To get this started, let's preheat the oven to 170C, 340 convection, a bit higher for conventional, and then I'll just season this generally with salt, just cooking salt is fine, and a few good twists of black pepper. As usual, this is more meat than you'd think, and we're only seasoning the outside, so be generous. Nobody likes a salt miser. Give that a good rub to ensure it's evenly seasoned and then grab a small roasting tin and roughly chop an onion into slivers to give us a bed for that lamb to sit on. On goes that lamb and then I had about 250 milliliters, a glass or so of red wine. Pretty much anything will work here. Personally, I prefer a fresher red with less bite, something fruity like a Beaujolais or a light Pinot Noir, but I don't have those in the wine cupboard today, so this robust Malbec will have to do. Usually for a shoulder, I'd slow roast, but that's not what I want today. I want some good chunks of lamb with a bit of bite to them, and I want it to still have some pinkness to it, as lamb should, IMHO. So I'll go with seven minutes per 100 grams, which is about half an hour per pound, I think. I'm adding a few sprigs of rosemary here too, which will give us a good bit of background flavor in the juices later. This is about 750 grams or one pound 10. So I'll cook it for 55 minutes and then I'll let it rest and cool completely. In that goes, time is set, so let's get on with the rest of the pie. Now we've done cottage pie here before on the channel, video linked here or in the description if you're watching on the TV. So in terms of veg prep at least, we're in familiar territory today. I'll start with an onion, just a good sized brown onion is perfect. And I'll peel that and I'll chop it sort of semi-finely. There's no need to finely dice it, but I don't want any super big chunks. Ideally this will melt into the background in the finished dish, but don't stress too much about it. Next up, garlic and a good amount, about five or six good sized cloves. Thanks to John Stout for this tip. Crush the garlic before topping and tailing it and it'll just fall out of the skin. Top time saving tip there, John. Cheers. Once they're peeled, I'll just roughly chop them and set them aside separate to the onion as I don't want them both to go in at the same time. I happen to have some carrots that need using up today and these will bring some texture contrast and sweet flavor to the pie. So I'll just peel and roughly chop those into good sized chunks that will stand up to the longish cook that we're gonna do today. And finally, the potatoes. As usual, I'm using a flowery Maris Piper. Whatever flowery variety you have locally will work. Waxy potatoes or a mixture of the two can work for this. Personally, I like the lighter mash I get with flowery, but you do you. I'll just peel those and chop them very roughly into one inch-ish cubes, which I'll pop into some cold water to chill out and soak out some of that excess starch. Potato top pies are some of the finest comfort foods money can buy. They're easy to make, easy to eat, fill in, and if done right, super delicious. We'll be making the mash slightly differently to how I'd normally do it today to account for the fact that it needs to stand up to that second cook in the oven. More on that later, but for now, let's get started on the filling. We'll need to get some color onto the meat. So in a pan large enough to do the whole thing in, I'll get some high smoke point oil. I'm using sunflower, good and hot over a medium high heat. Once that's shimmering, in goes the minced lamb along with a good strong grip of salt. Again, don't be shy. And a few twists of freshly ground black pepper. Then I'll just let that brown, moving it around and breaking it up occasionally to ensure it colors evenly. Lamb is a naturally fatty meat, so you'll get quite a bit of fat come out of this as it cooks. That fat is chock full of flavor and we will use some of it later. But for now, I'll just pour most of it off into a bowl and set it aside. Then I'll move the meat into a second bowl to hang out while we sweat down the veg. The carrots are chunky and there's quite a lot of water in them, so I'll toss those in first to begin to get a bit of color over that high heat. I'm not trying to cook these at this point. I'll just give them a minute or two, tossing occasionally, and then next, in goes the onion. 
I'll turn the heat down to medium low at this point and add another good grip of salt. And then I'll just let these sweat down, stirring occasionally to ensure nothing's burning for three or four minutes until softened and starting to turn translucent. Into that goes half the garlic, save the rest for later, you'll see. I'll give that a quick stir and let it cook for a minute or so until it's aromatic. As soon as that happens, I'll go back in with the lamb and about a teaspoon or so of plain flour. The flour might seem weird and we don't need a lot of it. The intention isn't really to thicken anything, but to help hold the emulsion together. The starch in that flour isn't much use as an emulsifier in itself, but the network it will develop will help hold the water and oil in suspension and just make it less likely to separate on us. Next, a glass, maybe 250 mils, just under half a pint of that red wine. Whichever you use for the roast lamb is good, and I'll bump the heat a bit to bring it to a simmer. Now, I like a bit of herbage in my shepherd's pie, and for that, I want a bouquet garni. You can go the traditional route of tying up a bunch of herbs with string and dropping them in, but I found these little herb ready-made tea bag things in Tesco the other day, and they'll save me a bit of time, so one of those goes in. There's thyme in that already, but I like a bit of extra punch, so I'm going to add some more. Again, you can do fresh if you like, but dried herbs are made for a longish simmer like this, so I'm just reaching for those. Next, add a couple of lamb stock pots. If you have homemade lamb stock lying around, then by all means use that. It will be awesome. I don't, so these things will do. Mine are made by Knorr. Other brands are available, but use something of decent quality. We're asking a lot from these in terms of our flavour story, so it's worth spending a few pence extra. Finally, a glass of water just to get things kicked off. That's maybe 200 mils, 250 mils. And then I'll bring this to a spirited simmer before turning the heat back down and leaving it to simmer uncovered until it's well reduced and the carrots are tender, but still with some bite. 30 to 45 minutes. While that does its thing, let's get some mash made. Now, as usual, the first thing we need to do is get rid of the excess starch from the potatoes. So for that, I'll rinse them really well and I'll change the water a few times until it's good and clear. Once that looks good, in goes a good pinch of salt and then I'll set those over a high heat to come to a boil before reducing the heat a bit and just letting them go. Now, total cooking time on these potatoes will be about 20 minutes, but do check them occasionally. As soon as they're fully fork tender and break apart when poked, they're done. This next step is totally optional, but I love lentils in a shepherd's pie. I know, I'm odd. These are just some dried green lentils that I've rinsed really well, super important. And the filling has been simmering for about 20 minutes or so at this point, so I'll just drop those in stir them through and keep an eye on the liquid from this point on. We don't want this to end up soupy. It should be quite dry when it's done, but those lentils will soak up quite a bit of water. So if it starts to look too dry before it's done, top it up with a little more. That's the timer for the roast lamb. So I'll pull that from the oven. This looks amazing. It's beautiful color. It absolutely smells delicious. Fantastic stuff. Now shoulder is quite a fatty cut with a lot of collagen and connective tissue. And the fast roast that we did here won't really have broken that down all that much, but it's ideal for what we want to use today. And we can use what's left for an incredible stock later. I'll put that to one side for now to rest and cool. And I'll take those whiny roasting juices and add them into my filling, being sure to press down on those onions and herbs to get all the flavor out. Stir that through and let it keep on cooking. I'll check the carrots for doneness at this point and have a look at the consistency. I want this to reduce a little more and the carrots are almost, but not quite done. I'll give it another five or 10 minutes. 10 minutes later, this is looking perfect. The carrots are cooked, but still have some bite. They'll stand up to that oven cook that comes later. I'm calling this done. It does need a little brightness to cut through that savory fatty lamb. I'm using a little cider vinegar here. Balsamic would do, but it might be a bit heavy. Definitely wouldn't use malt. But whatever vinegar you go with, you don't need much. We don't want this to taste vinegary, and there's plenty of acid from the wine. We just want to add a dash to bring a bit of fresh brightness to the very top of our flavor story. That's perfect. I'll just pop on a lid, turn off the heat, and let this hang out while I get everything else sorted. The potatoes are done too. These are perfect, fork tender, just falling apart. So off the heat they come, and I'll drain them immediately, but I'll hold back some of the potato water rather than letting it all go to waste. Remember I said we were doing the mash a bit differently today? Well, this is that. Instead of traditional milk, I'm gonna use the potato water to lubricate the mash. Milk is great generally, but for this dish, I think the water works really well. 
Plus it's already hot, it's already seasoned. It'll also help the mash be less creamy and let the butter and garlic really shine through, which works super well on a shepherd's pie. Speaking of butter and garlic, while the potatoes steam, I'll melt some good quality salted butter. This is maybe 50 grams or two ounces-ish into the pan that the potatoes cooked in. And then I'll add in the other half of the garlic that we saved earlier. I'll let that cook over a medium heat until it finishes foaming and the garlic just starts to take on a light color. And then I'll toss in a good handful of chopped fresh rosemary. I'll leave that on a low heat for half a minute or so until it's fragrant. And then let's mash. In go the cooked and steamed mostly dry potatoes and I'll just start breaking those up. I'm going in with a pinch of salt at this point. Don't go crazy. We can adjust it later if needed. I'll just give this a good mash to get things started. And then when I can see where we're at texture wise, I'll start adding back some potato water a little at a time, thoroughly mixing each addition until I get the consistency that I'm looking for. Now for shepherd's pie, you want your mash to be slightly drier than you'd probably make it if you were serving it as a side. And a few rustic lumps are no bad thing. So switch to a spoon once you have this kind of texture. This is looking great. I'll check the seasoning. It needs a touch more salt, so I'll add that. I'm just adding some sea salt crystals here, which will give some distinct salty pops in the final dish. It also needs a bit of pepper. White pepper works really well, but I seem to have run out somehow and I forgot to buy more. So black pepper it is, and that's done. That lamb shoulder has had plenty of time to rest now, so let's get that sorted next. As I say, the collagen in here won't have gelatinized with the quick roast. So I'll just carefully cut this into chunks, being careful not to get that connected tissue and leaving aside any really jelly-like bits of fat. The aim here is just to provide some texture contrast and wonderful deep roasted lamb flavor. Oh, it's so good. It doesn't matter that we won't get a ton of meat off this. It's just the cherry on top of the mince lamb's main event. I'll set aside the bone and connective tissue for later. You could boil this with some carrots, onions and herbs to make an amazing stock which will freeze really well for your next shepherd's pie. Or if you can't be bothered to do that right now, and honestly, I wouldn't blame you, then you can just freeze the lamb as it is and do the stock thing later. I'll just add those chunks of lamb to the filling along with the juices from the board, and then I'll stir everything through to combine. And I'll just give it a quick taste as an excuse for a snack, just as a final check that I'm happy. And I am. Wow, let's assemble that pie. For that, I'll just place the filling into a wide oven proof dish that's deep enough to comfortably hold the filling and potato topping. I'll leave an Amazon link down in the description to a dish that's similar to this one in case you don't have one handy, but you can get one from pretty much anywhere. Once that filling is in a nice even layer, the move is exactly the same as for cottage pie. I'll just use a fork to build up an even topping of the mashed potato. Obviously you can pipe this on if you like and you'll get a more refined look to your pie, but I don't need the hassle and associated cleanup of piping bags. So it's the fork method for me. And to be honest, I prefer a more rustic look to my potato top pies anyway. Whenever I pipe the potato on, I immediately think of those sad supermarket ready meal cottage pies assembled endlessly by soulless machines. <laughs> Whatever, go whichever way you wanna go. Once I've got a good even layer of potato on top of my pie, I'll go around the edge with the fork to form a light seal, and then I'll rough up the top to give me more crispy bits. Definitely do this. The crispy bits really are the thing that makes this. Now this is slightly cheeky, and totally non-traditional, but a little bit of Parmesan, freshly grated, absolutely perfect, really sets it off. Strongly recommend. And that's it. This goes onto a baking tray, unless you enjoy cleaning up burned on mess from your oven floor, and into the oven at 170C or 340F convection, a bit higher for conventional for about 40 minutes, until it's got some lovely brown bits on top and the filling is just starting to bubble through. This looks perfect. It smells divine, I can't even begin to tell you. It's an absolutely delicious shepherd's pie that's perfect for a family dinner, a Sunday, when you've got guests coming over, the depth of flavor is immense, it'll leave everyone satisfied. Give this a few minutes to cool, then dish it up generously onto some nice plates, add some green veggies of your choice and then dig in and be delighted. Make this one soon, folks. You won't be disappointed. And check out this playlist next for some more incredible pies that you won't want to miss.